Hi there, I'm Don Ennis. Welcome to the latest episode of Rise Up. Welcome to Pride Month. Pride is something that a lot of people have in their children, in their parents, in themselves. Pride for the LGBTQ community is something else. It means we're us. Don't just tolerate us, accept us. We want to be part of the world. And that's why we celebrate in all these beautiful rainbow colors. I recently went out in West Hartford, Connecticut and asked my neighbors, what is it you're proud of? What am I proud of? Right, this is Pride Month here in America. I was wondering what you are proud of yourself. I'm proud of my two daughters, they're great kids. So tell me, what are you proud of? To be British. To be British. And you, man? I'm proud of being American. Right. What are you proud of? What? Yeah, what are you proud, proud of? My children. I'm proud I just graduated summa cum laude from Northeastern University. And what are you going to do? I'm um, starting in a software company on Monday. So That's very awesome. Excited. That's awesome. And I hear your mom is proud too. Yep, she's proud of me and my brother. So my name is Dawn Ennis and I'm doing a TV show and I wanted to ask you what you're proud of. Uh, being African American. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I love your dog. What's your dog's name? Tashi. Uh -huh. And now we're joined by someone from an organization that everyone has heard of, but it may not be exactly what you think it is. Pat Comerford is the organizing and training specialist at Planned Parenthood. He started as a volunteer, as an intern, and now he's here to talk to us about what is Planned Parenthood. Welcome. Hi. Nice to meet you. Me. Actually, it's not the first time I've met you. We met in April. We did. At the Trans Lives uh, Health Conference at the University of Connecticut. Yep. Um, it was spectacular, by the way. I learned a lot especially from your presentation on activism and local politics. Now, the purpose of this show is to give people the reason to get off their butt, to mm. not sit at home, not be on the couch, not sit in your pajamas and yell at the internet, yell at the TV. <laughs> we want to give people a reason to be active in their community, mm. in politics, whatever it is that floats their boat. It doesn't have to be progressive politics. It happens to be mine. I share that with you. Thank you. And I'm asking you this. What can people do through Planned Parenthood to support the causes they believe in? Sure. So there's a lot of things that folks can do. Um, you know, I think one of the things when we talk about getting involved with Planned Parenthood that people oftentimes think of is volunteering in the health center or volunteering in our admin office, and that's really crucial. So we have a volunteer night every third Wednesday of the month where folks come, they get to meet other people, other reproductive rights activists, reproductive freedom folks, and get involved. But we also do a lot of political work. And so some of the work that we are doing, you know, we've spent a long time this past session, which just ended. Um, legislative doing, session. Yeah, this legislative session. Okay. Um, doing a lot of work to pass bills that would strengthen access to reproductive health care, among other things. Um, and so what we need to do now that summer is coming is really keep... Uh, pressure on Congress. We're looking at a lot of different attacks on Planned Parenthood, on funding streams, on access, um, the, the American Health Care Act that has moved mm -hmm. through the House and uh, is winding its way through the Senate in some capacity um, will have an impact. So really making sure that folks are contacting their, their representatives down in Washington, but also we're gonna be hitting the streets in key neighborhoods in Connecticut um, to talk to folks face to face about Planned Parenthood and build power in communities so that for the long term, we can really make sure we're, we're making some wins. And so. And I heard you just recently, you mean the organization, mm -hmm. was a key supporter of the law that Governor um, Danelle Malloy suffered, mm -hmm. uh, uh, signed last month to yes. outlaw conversion therapy. Now, why would get into that? Fight? Why would you Planned Parenthood get into that fight? Sure, sometimes people are surprised. And, by and that. you should explain what conversion therapy is because it's an important issue. Absolutely. So conversion therapy is any kind of therapy or practice that tells young folks that who they know themselves to be is a mistake and needs to be changed, right? So oftentimes around sexual identity or gender identity and expression. And so that can involve anything from cognitive behavioral therapy, conversations, to electroshock therapy. Um, it's a wide range of practices, but ultimately what it does is it tells young folks that who you are is not perfect. It's not who you're supposed to be and you mm -hmm. need to change. And so for us, one of the things that we do is really look at um, the whole 
patient that comes through our doors. Mm -hmm. So when people come through our doors, we really want to look not just at the healthcare that they're receiving that day, but really think about what are they facing out in the world? You know, our mission is about both protecting the fundamental right of every person to control their sexuality, mm -hmm. But it's also about making sure people have access to that right. And so one of the things that goes into that is having a strong sense of who you are and that that, that person is accepted and loved. Because what happens with conversion therapy is um, young folks who are experiencing that are often going through family rejection. Yeah. And, um, and young folks who've been surveyed to kind of talk about what that experience was like are shown to be eight times more likely to have attempted suicide. Right six times more likely to experience deep depression, and three times more likely to have gone through some sort of drug or alcohol addiction. So for us, it's a logical, our patients need to, um, to be protected, and that was, a, that was a logical step for us. Now, I noticed that whenever Planned Parenthood is on television, mm -hmm. your president was just on Seth Meyers' show on NBC. Yep, Cecile Richards, yeah. Which was great, but when those folks appear on some of the conservative media, mm -hmm the ideological questions um, to unsolvable issues seem to be forefront. Yeah. Um, yeah. When does life begin? Yeah. So yeah. how do you escape that trap that they try to set? Yeah, and it is a trap. Um, and I think people really genuinely want to talk about that. I, I get that, that's on people's minds. For me and for our organization, it is much more important to talk about the people in communities where access to Planned Parenthood can get cut off what happens to a community when there isn't access to comprehensive reproductive health care. You know, you take Planned Parenthood out of the equation and you're talking about a lack of access to things like birth control, contraception, breast cancer screenings, cervical cancer screenings. Um, that's really, really huge. And so to talk about just abortion, um, that's 3% of what we do nationally, that's to miss, and, and we do that proudly, and, and we're unwavering in that work. And it's to miss 97% of what we do. Say that again as far as the percentages. I'm yes. not sure people understand what, Absolutely. how so this breaks down. 3% nationally across the country of what Planned Parenthood provides to our patients end up being abortion services. And so 97% is preventative health care and access to birth control and contraception. And that is wildly different from what a lot of people think about Planned Parenthood. Well, the first thing they think is abortion clinic. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And yet, one in five women will go to a Planned Parenthood at some point in their life, you know? And one in three women will get an abortion. And those are important things. That is important work. And I went to Planned Parenthood when I was a teenager. I didn't want my parents to find out that I was sexually active. They had a relationship with my pediatrician. So I went to Planned Parenthood as a young queer person. You're a queer man. Yeah, absolutely. And so I didn't, you know, I was afraid to use my parents' insurance. Planned Parenthood was there for me in that in that right. And so I know that this is important to the queer community. I know it's important to our communities and large, largely who we serve are folks in need. You know, 50% of our patients are using our Medicaid recipients, you know? And here's something else That's that a lot deal. of people don't understand. The number one provider of transgender healthcare services in America mm -hmm. is Planned Parenthood. Now, how did that come about? So I can't speak how it came about to other affiliates, um, but for us, it came about as a need and a demand for services. You know, I, I think a lot of people know that it's incredibly difficult to find access to affirmative, uh, affirmative culturally competent healthcare for trans folks. Um, and so we have an obligation because we have an obligation to our patients to make sure that we're meeting people's needs. Um, and so we're actually in the process of expanding that work slowly. Um, you know, healthcare providers in the agency are going through training, administrative folks are going through training on what does it mean to create a culturally competent, a safe space for folks to come who are trans and gender non-conforming or non-binary and really be welcomed in a health center, welcomed in a health setting, you know? 23% um, of trans folks surveyed in 2015 said they didn't go to a healthcare provider that year because they were afraid of being misgendered. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty, it may not sound like much if a woman who is uh, uh, assigned female at birth is called a man, mm. she might blow it off and say, oh, that's silly, of course mm -hmm. not. But for a transgender person, our identity is staked in um, validation and af affirmation. And I can tell you myself, the drive-through window is my enemy. Mm. Hi, I'd like a Coke, please. 
I have to artificially raise my voice beyond where I think it normally is because the last thing I want him to say is, yes, sir. Sir, yeah, to, being to get sir yep. Or for a trans man to have to listen to someone call him a woman. It's just, mm. it's not who we are mm -hmm. and we want to be validated. Yeah. I want to ask you a question that goes to the heart of our country right now. This being Pride Month, I need to know why would you as a queer man care at all about women's health? Mm, why, yeah. why, why, would, why are you in this fight? Well, there's a couple answers to that. Um, so again, I told you that I used Planned Parenthood. Well, yeah, Planned but Parenthood that's matters as, that's, to me. But that's as a young man. You're, yep. you're an adult. And yeah, absolutely. So I think there are two answers to that. One, I think everybody needs to be speaking out about what's going on and making sure folks have access. So that is huge to me. Planned Parenthood sees LGBTQ patients. As a man, it is important to me. Now, my relationships will I'll likely never end in a pregnancy that needs to be tended to. That That's not something that I'm facing. And so when I first started I with the internship I was like oh, I'm not really I don't abortion doesn't bother me like but it's not my thing so whatever over my time with Planned Parenthood I have realized that my community needs it um, and I have talked to countless women who need it and who need access whether it's us or a community health provider to comprehensive reproductive health care and everyone no matter their gender, has an obligation to stand up and make sure that everyone has access to healthcare. Healthcare is a basic right and we need to look at it as such. And so being a man is never, it, it has meant that I am less welcomed in some spaces when I'm doing this work, I won't lie to you. Um, but for me, it's never been sort of at the forefront of my mind once I got a chance to see the work that we do. And I also think it's important, we often talk about, about Planned Parenthood or reproductive rights as women's health care. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, yes, women are disproportionately impacted by it. I believe that a large part of the targeting is because women are impacted by mm -hmm. it. And we have to talk about men who have abortions. Right. We have to talk about the fact that it is, you know, when we talk about women's health care, it might be politically expedient because politicians get it. It's not complicated. <laughs> but we actually need to make sure that we're bringing everyone into the conversation to talk about it as a human right. Well, there are men who need gynecological care yes. because they're trans men. Absolutely. And, and there are, um, you know, women who need prostate exams. Yep. So let's just face facts. Yeah. 1.4 million of us in America are transgender. And as a transgender woman, I can say that reproductive rights is important to me mm -hmm. because for me, I don't want men telling me what to do with my body. Yeah. And I can, uh, you know, relate to that fight because why should any um, man be in charge of what a woman does with her body and her body includes potentially a fetus? Mm -hmm. I, I need to understand from the viewer's perspective why there's so much controversy over funding. Mm. Doesn't Planned Parenthood get enough money from all its supporters? Why do you need the government to fund you? So we are across the country, so each affiliate is separate. So that's important to know. Like McDonald's. That each, yeah, in, in a way, we're not quite franchised, <laughs> but we are. We have a federation that oversees us nationally, and then we're, each affiliate is, is accredited. And each affiliate has a different funding stream from donors, from supportive folks, and that's really crucial. But funding streams like Title X, which is a family planning funding stream, mm -hmm. that's actually the money that allows us to slide to a, a zero on a, a sliding scale for our fees. So if someone can't pay, they get to come in and receive health care. They don't have and, to worry. And folks aren't turned away. Yeah, right. absolutely. And that is part of Title X funding. Our ability to see Medicaid patients at no cost to them to make sure they get what they need, that's actually about being uh, reimbursed for the services we provide. So Medicaid reimbursement is really, really important. No doctor's office can function without Medicaid reimbursement if they offer services um, where folks can use Medicaid. It's just, that doesn't work, you know? We're very lucky in Connecticut uh, where it's progressive politics, mm -hmm. but Texas, yes. Mississippi, Arkansas, yep. the Deep South, they are already passing laws that restrict funding. Absolutely, and Texas, four years ago, they cut off Medicaid funding right. and it's been disastrous for women's health. And how does that impact the community? If there isn't a Planned Parenthood, what's going to happen? If, I shudder to think, mm. if Roe versus Wade is overturned. Mm. Yeah. Well, so what happens without a Planned Parenthood in a community is, is pretty basic. People won't go to the doctor. We are the only healthcare provider that a lot of folks see throughout a year. 
um, because we are affordable and people can access us. And so without Planned Parenthood, you have, there's no way community health providers in those communities can, can keep up with the patient demand. Mm -hmm. There just is nowhere for folks to go. And so people won't go to seek health care. Um, and the reality is you take away Roe v. Wade, you take away the, the, the access to abortion, people will self-induce and it is dangerous and oh we will goodness. go back and we're seeing this in Texas. Is it really happening? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Folks are ordering uh, inducement drugs over the internet. You can, you know, I mean, it's, it's really had a profound, profound impact when people lose access. And so you can, you can look at that. We're lucky in Connecticut that we've codified Roe v. Wade. So even if it were to go away on a national level, Connecticut has actually put into state law years mm -hmm. ago that Roe v. Wade will stay here. Mm -hmm. But that's because it is so important to protect that kind of basic reproductive health care. Your health needs don't go away based on a law. But I do understand that if there were, and I read a study uh, recently about this, that there are tests on um, abortion pills, mm -hmm. like Plan B, but further along. Mm -hmm. If that were readily available and safe and approved, I don't mean to put you out of business, but I, feel, I think a lot of women would choose to be able to do it in the privacy of her own home. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, and that's, that's great. I mean, like any nonprofit, there is this kind of idea, you know, we are a healthcare provider. We want to be here for folks. There are healthcare needs that we don't provide today that we may provide in the future. Right. You know, who knows what the face of healthcare writ large will look like, including Planned Parenthood, as things become more accessible. As a social justice advocate, I want to see folks have the access to anything that they need and we will adjust. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times when we talk about protecting Planned Parenthood, it becomes, I think sometimes people think about it as protecting the organization. Mm -hmm. It is protecting our patients. And so as our patients needs shift or access shifts, we will shift to meet that, you know? I got to laugh when you said social justice because <laughs> It's that buzzword. I know, I'm, I know. I'm a social I try justice not to warrior, use it. apparently. I know. I try not to use it. Where's my shield? Where's anymore. my where's my Wonder Woman yes. shield? I have the Wonder Woman shoes, but I don't have the Wonder Woman shield. Um, so <laughs> tell me about this this is part of your presentation. Mm -hmm. How is it that you um, are active besides conversion therapy? What else is P Planned Parenthood offering that our viewers could get involved with your organization to, you know, to rise up? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the work we've done this session has been about um, a bill to increase access uh, to institutional aid for undocumented students. Um, groups like Connecticut uh, uh, C4D, uh, Students for a Dream, CIRA, the Connecticut Immigrant Rights Alliance, they've been leading this work um, on the immigration front. And so we've been supportive as possible and asking our supporters to take action in that way. Those fights will continue. Um, and I think people aren't used to hearing us ask that for our supporters. You're sort of crossing streams. Yeah, absolutely. But we have to think about who our patients are and who our communities are and, and stop thinking about it as only who they are when they come into a health center, you know? Um, and those are reproductive freedom issues. If someone is fighting for economic security, they're not going to prioritize their health care. Right. If it's between keeping on the lights and going to the doctor, we all know we won't go to the doctor. Um, and so those are some of the, the ways that, that we're going to continue the fight. Um, you know, there's legislation to protect access to the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. um, in Connecticut. That is really, really huge. And so those are some of the ways we will be continuing the work. Um, You've mentioned the con con conversion therapy work, HB 6695, which passed and was signed Send into law, law immediately. Um, Fastest bill he's ever signed. Yeah, it was. They raced us. If you look at the picture, I'm in a sweatshirt. <laughs> And I was not ready for governor time, but, uh, but it was really great. Yeah. Um, but that work, we're part of a coalition of folks um, uh, from across the state called CT Equality. And what website would people go to if they want to be involved? With CT Equality, they can go to equalityct.org. And what about Planned Parenthood? And for Parenthood? us, go to PlannedParenthoodVotes.org. Okay. And they can find out all sorts of information on how to, how to stay in touch. We'll put links to both of those That's on great. our website, lifeafterdawn.com. I'm curious. The mm -hmm. things I know about you so far is uh, you gave a great presentation in which um, I raised my hand when you asked, uh, who knows who these, you know, the, the president pro tem is or mm -hmm. the, the, the people in our politics and our government. A lot of people don't really know that kind yeah. of stuff. Does that bother you that people are generally misinformed about who's running our government? So does it, it doesn't bother me. It drives me crazy that we don't spend more time making sure people have access to that information. You know, I think- Hello, it's, Google? It's, I, I know, I know, <laughs> but, but when you're working three jobs, yeah. it's hard to go home and figure out 
who's the pro tem? <laughs> you know, I, like, yeah. it's, it's hard. And it's an unusual year this year because we have a yes. divided uh, uh, legislature. Yeah, there are extra titles going around, and it's, it is really confusing. Just but, what the men need, more titles. E yes. yes. Sorry, <laughs> yes. don't mean to bash men, but oh no my God. See, no shade, I'm, I'm in. But I think, you know, and people can go to cga.ct.gov and okay. they can... Say that again. In cga.ct.gov. Like, because even I talked fast and that was like, whew. I know, sorry. I'm so used to <laughs> rattling it off. Um, but I do think it's, it's, com it's a second job mm -hmm. following politics. I'm lucky enough to have it as my first job. It's so, awesome. Um, but all that info is out there. And you started as an intern. Mm -hmm. What story can you tell us was the most amazing thing that happened to you while you've been at Planned Parenthood? Either mm. as an intern or as a volunteer or as this um, organizer you are now. I'd love to hear about something that just stuck with you. It can be happy, it can be sad, whatever it is. Yeah, so I will tell you the thing that sticks the most to me has been the work with our young folks. So I work with young people. Um, and when we, in 2010, when I was an intern and we passed uh, gender identity and gender expression into law in Connecticut, um, again, CT Equality, we were part of that. Um, I had a young person come in that I had been working with just in tears oh. because it meant so much. And that for me was, that was it. That was, I was hooked on the work, to be honest with you, at that point. So um, seeing the impact of the work and wow. seeing the, and the shift that, that, it, that it makes for folks in their lives. I'm incredibly grateful, and our viewers are too, for taking the time today. Pat Cumberford, Planned Parenthood, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Now, every month we have a special correspondent, someone who tells us a little bit about what they're doing to rise up. This month, it's Monica Roberts from Houston, Texas. Monica? Good day. Good day. Uh, thanks, Monica Roberts. Uh, I was asked by... Uh, Dawn uh, Ennis, uh, as part of her Rise Up show, to talk to you folks about, you know, what I do as an advocate down here in the Lone Star state of Texas and doing so for about 20 years now, almost 20 years now. It actually you know, got started um, back in, the, in 1998 uh, after, you know, being ticked off, uh, say, literally about an, an article in a trans theme publication that uh, led me to vow to go to Washington to lobby. And that had been doing so ever since on behalf of this community and others. One of the things that, you know, that I like doing and why I do it is because, you know, I can't stand bullies, I say, especially bullies that have legislative power. Um, and the other thing about this is trans rights are human rights issues. Uh, that is a given. That is not. That is non-negotiable, and that is also uh, something that needs to be a reality. I say an accepted reality uh, in this country and across the world where I say we trans folks inhabit the planet. What are the things I do to advance um, I say our you know, human rights? Um, in addition to my now 11 year old blog called Trans Korea, um, I also have lobbied at the state and federal level um, in the states of Kentucky where I used to live for about almost eight and a half years in my home state of Texas. Um, I've lobbied, you know, say the city of Houston. I've also lobbied uh, the city of Louisville. I've lobbied school districts to pass uh, trans inclusive policies both in those two locales. Um, and um, I'm there, you know, to stand up for other groups when they are doing the same thing in terms of standing up for their human rights. As for when did I transition? Um, you know, I, fi I finally stepped up about 1994 to do so. Um, and I like to say my life began when I transitioned. Um, 
because you know I've gotten to do some amazing things over the last couple of years since then. Um, I've gotten a chance to go to the White House several times. I've gotten a chance to meet amazing people inside and outside this community that I probably wouldn't have met if I had not done so. Um, there are folks, I uh, think, you know, across this country and this planet that I call my friends. Um, and, you know, the fact that I'm happy and comfortable in my skin is something that you cannot uh, pay, uh, put any kind of price on. It's also been interesting to watch the journey of trans rights from the time that I have started uh, to now. While we have made some amazing strides as a community, um, you know, the inevitable backlash from our right-wing opposition was going to come, and it has, and definitely has been pushed full force here in Texas over the, you know, over the last year, but as you can see, we've been fighting them back just as hard as they've been pushing us, uh, and we will continue to do so even with this, uh, as I call it, special oppression session that's coming up uh, in Austin starting on July 18th. I'm also kind of thinking about at this time, you know, the 12 who have been murdered due to anti-trans violence of, you know, say, in 2017. And what saddens and angers me at the same time is that out of those um, 12 that we have lost, all of color, uh, and 11 of the 12 are African American. Nine of those 12 are under age 40. You know, that means they will not reach my age. That's a travesty. I said, you know, our trans lives matter. Uh, black trans lives matter. Latino trans lives matter. We are not your political I say, wedge issue. We are not, you know, your, you know, your secret fantasies and stuff. We are human beings who want to live our lives to the best of our ability and, you know, express our talents to the world, um, you know, just like anybody else. And, you know, that's my take on things at this time, you know. And thanks, Dawn, for being patient with me as I carved out some time in my busy, you say, some as a increasingly busy schedule to do this video and hope your viewers enjoy it. Thank you, Monica. We're very happy that you joined us this month on Rise Up. We'll be back next month with a brand new episode and new guests. I hope that you will continue to remember that Bruce Springsteen sang, Come on, rise up. <laughs>